We are so proud to have these ladies here. Thank you very much. We welcome back Marianne Andreas, who was part of our Native Her Stories lecture in uh, January of 2020. So thank you for coming back. And Lorraine Sisquak, who is the Cultural Traditions Leader at Sherman Indian High School and the curator of the Sherman Indian Museum. Uh, she taught museum studies, basket making, and native plant uses and material cultural traditions at Sherman Indian High School and throughout Southern California. So thank you very much for coming and uh, sharing your lecture with us. So what we will do today is I'm going to uh, kind of be bad and white as well. I'm going to work the board. Uh, Lorraine has done a beautiful presentation on this sort of the overall uh, use and uh, history of boarding schools. So we'll see that first and then we'll uh, hear Mary Ann's history and then have some questions and answers uh, after the presentation. So uh, with that, I'll have the mic here. And thank you. Should be good to go. Okay, um, thank you once again for inviting inviting me and um, allowing us to tell this story. I know it's um, going around a lot these days about boarding schools and the history, but it's, it's a long history and we've been telling it a long time, but I'm glad people are finally listening and, and learning and understanding the effects of boarding school uh, on our people throughout history. So I'm just going to share a little bit about um, the boarding school history and then our own, my own family history in there and uh, a little bit about the school I work, uh, the history of it. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing Mary Ann's story. I've heard some of it and it's, it's very, very relevant to this whole thing and very, very um, um, telling of, of what's going on nowadays and, and about the healing that we all need to be going through. And, and acknowledging, and so I'll start with that. Um, and so um, I'm an enrolled member of the Fort Sill Apache tribe of Oklahoma, which is Cherokee Apache, and I'm a descendant of Mount Kuya from uh, here in Southern California. Our ancestral village is uh, uh, at um, the village called Paul Pisa, which is near the Kuya Reservation in Anza, and our family is a Largo family. My mother's uh, uh, maiden name is Largo. And in our uh, Patch family, uh, we come from the Goody family. Okay. Um, so the off-reservation boarding schools uh, was, were established to solve the Indian problem, which was basically our land and, and resources and everything uh, that goes along with that. Um, the only good Indian is a dead Indian was the terms used in those early days. Uh, kill the Indian, save the man. And that was kind of one of the philosophies behind the boarding school system to totally immerse them into the white man's culture. And so, um, okay, next slide. And so um, uh, the first Indian boarding school was Carlisle, um, first off reservation Indian school boarding school was Carlisle. And so Richard Henry Pratt was one that uh, helped to establish that. And um, he, um, uh, felt he had success with his experiment at Fort Marion in St. Augustine, Florida, with the captive uh, warriors that he was um, that were under his um, under his, under him, and so he felt by cutting their hair, forbidding tribal language, uh, uh, changing the clothing, just totally wiping out any um, signs or any anything of native, and totally immersing them into the mainstream culture, which also required religious studies. And so, um, and I'm going through this really brief. This is, this is such a deep story. There's so much to learn. So I hope some of these will just spark your interest to research further or ask more questions. Um, so, so for example, some of the things that showed his experiment was working. Uh, Ms. Harriet Beecher Stowe described the warriors as being the wildest and most dangerous and most untamable of the tribes. Pratt, by all public standards, succeeded in transforming them from wild, bloodthirsty savages who terrified America to uh, resettlements, American settlements, to near white men who could read, write, farm, and who quoted and preached from the Bible. So, so with that, those results, he felt you know it was a success. So why not <clears throat> take the children and um, and do the same thing? It totally immerse them, remove them from any uh, from their home environment, from their family environments, from and totally immerse them into that. And so that's basically how it started, and it, it was approved and. 
um, set up at Carlisle. This picture is of the children at Carlisle Indian School, and you can see in the front row how young some of the kids were all the way up into their 20s. And all of this is available online. I didn't send a link to that, but Carlisle um, does have a good uh, resource. They have all of theirs digitized, and you can really find a lot of information. Next slide. And so the uh, off-reservation boarding school system was born to remove children from family and tribal environment. There was also the outing program that was implemented, and I just found out it was also uh, at St. Boniface, which we'll talk about later. And that outing program was designed more like a um, uh, uh, exchange student type thing we know today, where where maybe we go to another country and we'll, we'll live with other families and learn about that lifestyle and, and sure you help out, you're part of the family, you do some chores, but it quickly turned into a domestic trade and it was they were more or less servants uh, from the get-go really. But it was supposed to be established to send them to good white families in the community is what the word said in the documents and so that they could further, uh, further assimilate. So instead of returning home for vacation, students were placed with good white families to further assimilate them. So during Christmas, the holidays, or which, which of course we didn't celebrate anyway, but but still, the, during the holiday season, the summer, um, they weren't usually sent um, back home. They were sent to live with other families. Um, and, and our family, that happened with my grandmother, which I'll share a little bit of. Uh, down the road. Uh, vocational training uh, for boys and domestic science for girls was the main um, curriculum in those early, early days. And I'm talking, so Carlisle was in the 1880s and so uh, up until the um, 1910. So go ahead, next slide. Um, so in our family, uh, we did have a, a family that attended Carlisle. Um, Carlisle Industrial School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania was the flagship Indian boarding school in the United States from, from 1879 until 1918. Shalako Indian School, this was where my grandmother went, was an agricultural school for Native Americans on reserve land in north central Oklahoma from 1884 to 1980. And then she also, her and my uh, another grandfather went to Phoenix Indian School and uh, that school was from 1891 to 1990. And then here in Southern California, the first uh, off-reservation boarding school established was called Paris Indian School. And we later became, well, from 1892 to 1904, we were Paris Indian School. Then we moved to the site um, in Riverside from 1901 until 1970, we were called Sherman Institute. And then from 1970 to present, we're called Sherman Indian High School. So those were the schools that our family and my family went to. So this is um, our grandfather. This is my my uh, maternal grandfather. It's uh, my my grandma's uh, dad, Talbot, and he attended Carlisle Tony from Beth? yeah. This is my mom Tony's um, grandpa, and he attended Carlisle from 1887 to 1890. And um, these are just some pictures of him then. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. And so. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Carlisle has uh, their, their uh, records digitized, so I was really excited to um, find these online. And also one of the um, uh, archivists that's worked with, Barbara Landis, that has worked on the Carlisle archives 20-some uh, uh, years ago with sending pictures and news, uh, news, news articles and things on him. So I've been very fortunate to obtain these. And this is just, just some of the records of of him uh, at Carlisle Indian School. And what year was this? Uh, 1890. Mm -hmm. So, and a lot of times they were had to be signed in for several years at a time. Um, so the grandmother records which shows that too. Instead of just year to year, the whoever's um, registering them had to agree that they would stay like at least three years, so many years without going home. Mm -hmm. And so this is him uh, later. Uh, on our family, we're called Fort Sill Apache because we're, we um, were imprisoned by the United States government from um, 1886 until 19, um, our particular group was 1914. And so this is my, this is my grandma, this is my mom's mom. That's Talbot, the one who attended Carlisle, and our grandma Annie. 
and my siblings and um, uh, some of her siblings. And this was at Fort Sill Army Base where they were imprisoned by then because they're not in shackles. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's 27 years of imprisonment. So they surrendered in 1886 or negotiated with the United States government. And it was supposed to just be a few years of imprisonment. But that's a whole nother long story, but it ended up to 27 years. So in 1887, the next year, that's when he was sent and other Apache kids were sent to Carlisle. In fact, it was in the fall that they started, and in the spring of the next year, they were sent. There. And he was in his 20s. So this is just a sample of a new, the news article, The Indian Helper, which has a lot of information. And I encourage you, if you want to learn more on this, the original school, these are all online for you to look at, and it has a lot of interesting things and a lot of history, a lot of stories, a lot of um, things you can even find out about your families that attended there. And so they have a little article about him here and I'm just, just sharing that. And this is him um, in his later years. As, as I mentioned, he died in 1962 and he was 97, I believe. And so he lived a long, long life. But what I wanted to point out in our family is um, they did assimilate. They did uh, assimilate as 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 much as possible. And, and he became a carpenter. Was was one of his his trade that he learned at Carla. But, but him and some of the others that I'll be sharing in a few minutes um, also retained their, the culture, the language, and things like that. So on here, it just has a little bit about his um, his, his bio, and it also says when he went to uh, his first wife, he married three or four times. Uh, his first wife, they were taken to Carlisle and she died there and the baby and they're buried and they're one of the uh, un unmarked graves there at Carlisle that we'll be hearing hear about of, of his first wife. And then down the road, he married our grandma, our great grandma, um, Annie, and had uh, um, uh, eight children and um, that one of them being my grandma. And so what I wanted to mention here that he was a noted senior and he uh, revived our mountain spirit ceremony. So, cause all those years of imprisonment, we weren't allowed to do those types of ceremonies. And so once, so I, I think that's very, um, it just shows, you know, the, the, uh, the resilience of our people. And of course there's others that didn't because they were afraid or ashamed or, you know, all of those things. But, um, I, I, I think it's um, something very special to, to us and our family. And so so it was passed on, and this is our dance group today, for the, same, the Goody Dance Group, the same, his descendants from his son, Robert. And next one. And I'm so happy to say that my sister, who lives in Oklahoma, um, is dances, uh, dances on occasion with the group too. So it's, you know, just something that's carried on, not, not, not many things were in our particular family, but these are just some things of resilience and and perpetuating our culture and traditions. This also, I'd like to share that this is our, um, uh, as we said, I said Fort Sill Apache from Oklahoma, but we're originally from you know, the New Mexico, Arizona, from the, the Southwest, and um, they removed them from the reservation over a hundred and some years ago in the whole history. And, in a lot of documents on that, our grandfather Talbot talking about he want, they want to go back to their homeland, back to their homelands. They didn't want to stay on other tribal land. And this is and a hundred and some years later, long after he's gone, I think it was, I can't remember the year, but within the last 10, 10 15 years, we uh, were able to uh, acquire, have uh, land put into trust in our first reservation. Oh, wow. And so this is my grandson and I going and we went back and we were able to pick Yaka and just to me it was so like I was you know, talking to him Talbot in my you know in my heart or in our prayers just that you know we're here we're back and and so I think that's very significant too so it's a lot of things that these boarding schools did and we're now in that healing phase most families and people and so um, on our Kuya side our, our family attended Paris Indian School um, our great uncle or grandfather, and um, uh, and then another great uncle attended uh, Carlisle. Go ahead and go. And they were also sons of of some of our leaders of Manuel Largo and uh, Juan Antonio. Th these young men. Go ahead and go to the next one. 
And so this is our great grandfather, my mom's grandpa, um, um, Anthony Largo. And he, I have found his records in our in Paris Indian School in Sherman. And more records of his brother at, Car at Carlisle Indian School. Go ahead. And then, and then this was from his brother, Thomas. And I just wanted to read a few things. This was his, when I started working at the museum at Sherman, uh, got looking through all the archives and I found a bio on uh, Thomas Largo, who is our grandfather's brother. And he talked about, it's a long bio really wonderful, good information. And the first part, he talks about life at Kauia, and then he was attending the day school at Kauia, but then he got sent to Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And he says, um, uh, oh, at Paris, or Phoenix, at Paris Indian School. And he says, uh, they were very strict at Paris Indian School. And we did not, they did not want us to talk our Indian tongue. And if we did and were caught at it, we were punished. So. This is in the words from our, our relation. At Paris, we only went to school for half a day. The other half was spent doing some kind of work. And my first job was herding pigs at the school. And if we didn't watch those pigs as the instructor thought we should, they'd give us a whipping when the pigs would scatter in all directions. One particular occasion when we didn't watch the pigs as the instructor thought we should, it was because we were going to be in the Thanksgiving program and had to learn some verses to say. And on that particular occasion, I suppose I was more interested in learning the verses than I was in watching the pigs. So after the pigs jobs, I was put to work as an office messenger. And I think I must have liked that better. So it, you know, it kind of gives a, a description of, of life there. Um, he says, at the Paris school, there, there were children from many of the other Indian reservations in Southern California. So we got acquainted with other Indian children and like to hear them talk about things at their home. However, on account of the shortage, they moved to uh, Sherman in Riverside. So it is a really interesting uh, well, bio. The the shortage, oh, shortage uh, that, of water. that was okay. one of the reasons was said, but that's a whole nother dissertation that was done that you can research about why we moved to Riverside, but go ahead. And so uh, this same uncle, um, uh, he um, was instrumental in, in 1904, there was an ethnographer, Charles F. Loomis, who came out to the school to record the, 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 the native kids and, and their songs. He was uh, targeting the California, the local tribal kids. And so in the 90s, I, and I got a, a catalog from the, the Library of Congress and, um, on the California Indian Wax Cylinder Project. So I immediately look up Kauia and then I find this and, and find him and Faustino Lugo and Ignacio Costo, all of Mount Kauia descent, were singing the, the our bird songs. Mm -hmm. And so I ordered the, the tape, it was a cassette tape at the time. And you know, it's our same songs that we're singing. And it was just something else too that on, on our Kauia side that, you know, sh showed that, that resilience, even though they went through the whole they still, you know, held on to those things. And unfortunately, they weren't passed down to me by them, all these things that I'm talking about. It's been a, a roundabout way of healing and correcting things and now passing it on in our family as, as we can. So go ahead. And so our grandfather, um, uh, uh, Joseph Argo, my mom's dad, he attended Phoenix. Go ahead. And then my grandmother, this is in her own writing of the school she went to. So first grade, she was she was born in 1903. So she was 10 years old when she started first grade at Shilako Indian School, mm -hmm. the first three years. Then she went back home for a year uh, to Fletcher, Oklahoma, to a grade school, uh, and then, then to Phoenix Indian School. And then in those days, in the 20s, and same at Sherman, you didn't graduate with a high school diploma, you would get a, a vocational certificate in the trade. And so she wanted to get her high school diploma. So same at Sherman, they allowed this to some students stayed on or lived with the families in the community and attended a public school. And that's what she did. She said she went to Phoenix Union High. She'd take the bus from the school, stayed at the school, the Indian school and take the bus and got her high school diploma. But she was, this was 1925, so she was what, 22, 22 years old when she got her high school diploma. And she worked here and then she went to Haskell and got her teaching credential. And she became a teacher in the Indian schools. And, and that's a whole nother long story too. <laughs> but we are doing a documentary on her because we have her words from an interview she did in 1970, her whole life story. So we're doing a little short documentary on telling her story. 
So this is Shalako Indian School and Renner Siblings. Do I just took the screen? Or you... Yeah, you did. Oh, didn't work. Go ahead. And, and, and this is all Shalako in And this is her graduating class when she graduated in the 10th grade, you know, before. Uh, and this is her here, and this is her sister. And so go ahead. And there's some of her records at Haskell Indian School. Go ahead. And then her graduating picture, and they said she was, um, what did it say? She was in the normal program, that was the teacher's program. It was peaceful, thoughtful, and Very refined, fine. always sweet, modest, and kind. <laughs> and they're, they're so cute, just their little hairstyles and the comments, and it's, it's, it's interesting. And this is by the 20s, 1920s. Go ahead, his next one. And then this is her teaching at the, in, now these were day schools. And so she taught at it, uh, uh, Salt River, uh, here's at Sherman, and then at uh, Tuba City, and then in Blackwater, um, in, these are all in Arizona. And when they were at Tuba City, Tuba City, that's when my mom came of age to um, junior high, almost high school age. And there was the only choice for the Indian kids was to go to a boarding school when grandma didn't want her to go. So they relocated out here to Sherman. So they lived on the campus and um, my mom went to public school. So that ended kind of our family in going to boarding schools and then now we're all working there. <laughs> and so my mom worked at Sherman from 1969 to 2000. This is her, she was instrumental in helping to start our first powwow there. Um, she promoted, uh, a culture in, in her, her door, she was a dormitory supervisor and um, things like that, because that's what helped us with our healing, you know, um, um, from all the, the um, effects of the, those, those things that we're talking about. So our culture traditions is what helped to heal us and help to correct things. So this is her and her dorm. So that's kind of our boarding school history. Myself, I've worked there since 1982, but when I was born in 1960, we lived on the campus because my grandma worked there. So Sherman's been our home all this time. So I'll just real quickly go through this of uh, uh, Francisco so we can go on. But this is Paris Indian School uh, located on Ramona Expressway and Morgan Street. Go ahead, go to the next one. Does it still exist like that? No, no, oh, okay. no, everything's gone. And um, um, uh, a little bit about that, um, we, um, in about uh, 20 years ago, uh, we got word that they were gonna build a distribution center, a Whirlpool distribution center over the site. So we went, Jean Keller, who wrote the book, Empty Beds on, on Sherman's history, uh, her, her and I went to the city planner. They had no information about it, the historic site, a cemetery, nothing. And so uh, we had, to make a long story short, we had, I had documentation of, of burials there, or of a, a burial there, but, and then um, word of mouth by elders in, in, in the community, and also a gentleman that his family lived on that land after they sold it, that there was a cemetery there. Um, we have never found it. We had ground penetrating radar done. We had monitors following. So I'm hoping during these investigations that that will be looked into because we've gone as far as we can so it needs to be found and that's a whole another story there so a little bit just Paris Paris and then this one is a shot of the little girls at Paris you can see the you can see how young these babies were okay go ahead and then the outing program which you shared about that grew into a work program and lasted until the 80s by then it was just a day job for students who wanted they wanted to go and get you know, minimum wage pay and mow lawns and things like that. So it it evolved into something else, but we no longer have that program. It's just not safe to send kids out to yeah. every, anybody. Go ahead. The trades, go ahead. We, we kind of showed those. And um, the, the domestic trades for the girls and learning to be a farmer's wife. And these are all the early days when I'm talking about. Um, the original school building, go ahead. And this this was demolished. This this building was demolished in 1970. Mm -hmm. These were the old school building. Once again, the young children. Go ahead. And then the parade grounds, which all of these schools were 
um, um, structured uh, under military structure until 1938. Mm -hmm. So they were all, you know, they would march and raise the flag every morning and retire the flag and have a Sunday parade. And there's been a lot of research, a lot of, uh, we've had several dissertations done um, using our archives. And so there's a lot to read. Uh, I can also send um, um, Francisco um, the reading list too, if any of people are interested. And so this shows our Sunday morning parade. Go ahead. And some of the students, and majority of these are from our local tribes, and a lot of people can find their grandmothers mm -hmm. and grandparents. And we have the names of these kids. Mm -hmm. Go ahead to the next one. Mm -hmm. And the boys. And you can see once again, this is 1908 at Sherman. You can see once again the young ages. And we do have all of these um, photos, like over 10,000 photos. and our registration records and just all of our documents are um, digitized now uh, through UCR, um, uh, got a grant for us to do this, a clear grant, and all of these have been digitized and I did send the link to, to Francisco um, for the Calisphere link and so you can find a lot of these. Go ahead. We'll just go th scroll through these real quick. The dining hall, next one. Um, the domestic training, babysitting, and this young little lady right here, she was the daughter of one of the superintendents and she came to the museum maybe two, three years ago. We got to meet her. She's like in her 90s now, but that was her. And so even employees have a lot of connection to, we call them the BIA brats. You travel around to the different Indian schools, just like an army brat, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of non-Indian and Indian have close ties to these schools. They grew up there and, and it's really interesting to hear some of the stories. Mm -hmm. Then we also had the farm from 1901 to 46. Um, the farm was uh, five miles west of the school. We bought 110 acres and they had the, the, the barn, um, a, a boy's dorm, a girl's dorm, and a schoolhouse. Yeah, go ahead and go to the next one. And um, let's see, yeah. Uh, I think there was one before that. Okay. Yeah. And this is the ranch there that was sold in 1946 and all that was kept was the next one is a cemetery. And uh, we still uh, have the cemetery there. This was in the 60s. And um, the next one, this uh, shows the names of that are laid to rest there. Um, unfortunately, um, we are not able to determine who is in which plot. I had ground penetrating radar done there 20 some years ago, and we know the layout, but we have no, all of the headstones by the time I started um, um, volunteering at the cemetery with, the, with other community members, the majority of them were destroyed already. And um, you, you could, you don't, we don't know who's where. So that's one of the things we're dealing with right now. Go ahead. And so, um, so what we did was we had um, an, an Eagle Scout, a uh, young man, Jason Abrister, uh, did took it on as a project and Pachanga donated the funds and we had new headstones and the reason they don't have names is because we don't know who's where. We know what the, they lay out and, and so, okay. And we'll just scroll, scroll through. That's a whole lot of that and we go out, we do the in flower day like most of our local tribes do. Uh, Mr. Levi helped us start that. Mm -hmm. We thought we were starting it up here. <clears throat> then I find in the bulletins they were doing it years ago. In okay. May? Yeah. And then May candles 3rd. in November. Yeah, we haven't done the candles, but we've done the, this. Go ahead and just scroll on through. Um, boarding schools, what some of the attractions to bring people in and retain is the music departments. Next one. Uh, sports and keep going. And then also all of our, all of these schools had the religious program, which was mandatory um, up until, I think it was not until the Native American Religious Freedom Act passed in the seventies, late seventies, that they could no longer be forced or you know, made to go. But all these were established uh, next to our school for our school for that purpose. This was the Protestant chapel, now it's a Baptist church still there. And St. Thomas is still there, just they have a new building. And that was established for our school. There was others too. And I just always love to show this, how stylish our ladies <laughs> uh, This is, um, let's see, Laura Primo. And then um, uh, one of the Quintanos from TM. Um, I think this is Nina Quintano. I, I don't have the names of them. But I just, yeah, yes, really stylish. Yeah. 
her, her sister um, uh, was I was very close with her sister Esther Esther, Esther Quintana yeah mm -hmm. Esther and Kim go ahead so we had a, the, this is more of the history we'll we'll just scan through this go ahead and go to the next and these are just some of the monuments this is our, our World War II veteran monument um, our um, Centennial Rose Garden go ahead and we'll skip these just go on head down the line. Just these are just monuments on campus that were put by our students. Very significant, but um, I just just wanted to share a little bit of them. Go ahead and go to the next one. And then our buildings. A majority of our buildings were named after different um, important people of, of our school. Uh, the shops building, 1939. They still stand, but in that building we have the the Dr. Uh, Clark's uh, namesake, the Clark Culture Center. Um, and it, it was also the Clark Behavioral Health Center. He's a graduate of 1939. Um, he went on to become a doctor and um, was very, um, he promoted our Indian ways of healing also in his practice and he was a, a, a very, very important person. Um, we got to meet him and, and really um, admire him. We have a lot of information on him if people want to. There's so many, um, important people and leaders that we don't learn about and, and we need to learn more. So we try to encourage our students to learn about, he's from the Wallapai tribe, but he, he was in the class with Mr. Levi and all of them, they were all, all buddies. Um, our uh, Wayne Bennett Memorial, he was a uh, graduate of 1970 and went on to Vietnam and was uh, died in action. So they named uh, one of our buildings after him. Ira Hayes Stadium was named after Ira Hayes who did not attend the school, but his uh, tribes, uh, students that from his tribe wanted to name it. Go ahead and go. And this is our museum. That's just the only remaining building on campus of the old school. And our this is what our museum holds, the records from 1892 to present, school memorabilia, artifacts, the library, artwork, photographs. And we also offer a lot of programs. And this is some of the archives. This is the original red tape. We always hear about the red, red tape right there. These are the old books where we get a lot of the information and these stories uh, from. And go ahead. Red handwriting. Mm -hmm. This is our mu museum, a little picture into our museum. Go ahead. And that keeps scrolling on the student body presidents and the museum, a lot on our veterans, honoring our veterans. And then our alumni are very important alumni who also, uh, just like how I mentioned my grandfather and our grandfather and his and then um, Thomas Largo on, on continuing and, 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 and preserving and the resilience in the culture. Some of these are alumni too. Uh, um, uh, Robert Yellowtail was a, a, a tribal leader, a very important man you should research. Uh, he graduated in 1909, I believe. Thomas Banyaka, also when he came to Sherman, he was known as uh, Thomas Jensen, but he was also a very important spiritual leader and um, uh, just a leader in, in, of, in Native American um, community or on beyond. Um, not Lauren Green, but yeah. Rus Russell Moore, uh, he became a, a very important jazz musician and he played with Louis Armstrong and mm -hmm. this, he was from a Gila River tribe. Thomas Anyaka was Hopi, and then Mr. Levi, we named our auditorium after him. He did not graduate from Sherman. He left and graduated from Palm Spring High, mm -hmm. but he was, he would have been the class of 39, and he attended for several years, and then came back and was an employee there for 38 years. Uh, but what he, one of the things he did was he recorded the, the, our Kauia bird songs at our school, just like 1904, they were recorded. And then in 1998, with the help of Sam and Wow, um, uh, James Ramos and, and, and others, uh, they were recorded at our school. And now you hear them sung. That's not the only reason that they're all sung all over. There was many others, leaders like him that did, but he was one of them. Um, and he also brought back our school song. And he was an alumni president. And he's the one who got me to work at the Sherman Museum. He was one of my teachers. And then Frank Clark. Go ahead. I think we're done. Yeah, so that's hopefully not too long, but about Sherman history and family history. Let me give an update, though. Um, we'll leave for that. So, yeah, please give your hand. I know we're having glare issues online for folks that are online, so sorry about that. Um, on the screen. 
uh, yeah, they can't because the windows. Uh, our wonderful mid-century modern building is doing what it was designed to do, which is put light into here and it's glaring. So uh, I apologize. If you're online, please put your email into the chat and I will send out um, the presentation if it's okay with Lorraine and also the links that she was going to provide to for whether you want to do more research into the subject or folks that you might know um, that might have been in one of these systems. We'll include that as well. And I'll include a link to my lecture on St. Boniface also that happened last week. That's on our uh, library YouTube page. So that's the update. Uh, any questions uh, we'll, get to, we'll get questions at the end. Let's do your okay. right. So I'd like to introduce our next uh, co-presenter. This is Marianne Andreas. She is a tribal elder from Morongo. Please give her a hand. And we invite her back and she's graciously come back to uh, the second event. She was also part of our Native Her Stories lecture last year in January 2020 where there was over 45 people that came out online to view that as well. And she was a former student of St. Boniface here in Banning. So she's going to talk about her early days there. And then after that's done, if you have questions, we'll go into uh, a QA. and a So uh, thank you for coming back, Maria. You're welcome. You. Thank you. Welcome, everybody online and everybody in person. Very brave souls. Um, my story actually starts 100 years ago. Uh, my mother would have turned 100 years old this past Christmas Eve, and she and her family, her brothers and sisters, were the first uh, of, of my family taken by force to uh, St. Boniface Catholic Indian Boarding School. And um, she said she was eight when they took her. She didn't. She was raised in a home that spoke only her Kauai language. And uh, her younger sister, her, her daughter is here today, my cousin Janice, uh, she was six, like me, six. And uh, her brothers uh, were older, they were teenagers, but they, they were all taken. And uh, one of my uncles was blind, so he wasn't able to do the vocation that, that the vocational training that Lori talked about. They did a lot of carpentry. There's a lot of, if, I don't know how familiar you are with St. Barnabas, there's a lot of beautiful rock walls up there, and they 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 did that. And he wasn't able to participate in those kinds of things because he was legally blind. He he didn't see. But uh, the, my uncle Mariano, my uncle Joseph did, and they talked about it in old, in their older age. Not much. Uh, Janice's mother never spoke of it. So things I guess that were painful. We we don't talk about. But my mother talked to us about it and. Um, Till her dying day, she remain, remained a devout Catholic. Uh, uh, so uh, anyway, um, they they remained there. Not they learned English. They were taught domestic um, science, or whatever we call that. <laughs> but uh, and vocation for the men. There was they had their own laundry. They were pretty pretty self supporting. They had. Uh, um, fruit orchards, they had gardens, they had um, a lot of things. And um, by the time, and then when they turned eight, when they graduated from the eighth grade, they were from high school, I guess, I don't, they uh, were taken to Los Angeles and they were uh, to work for domestics for professional people. And um, one, of, one of my cousins, uh, has a son, my mom's aunt had a son who had the same name, last name as the doctor that she worked for. So that tells you how that worked out. <laughs> and um, uh, Janice's mother, it was during World War II, um, met her father who was in the Navy and who was a Seneca Indian from New York. And they got married, he took her home and she didn't come back for some 30 some years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 30 some years, but they had a big uh, family of eight. My mother and I had a family of seven. And then uh, when um, when uh, my, my mother grew up and got married, obviously, and had children, um, she became very ill. She got tuberculosis, and, and I'm talking really, really sick. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember the day they carried her out. and. Uh, didn't realize it would be three years again before we would see my mother. And we would, uh, the three oldest would be taken to St. Boniface. I was six, my brother John was eight, my sister Patty was 10. And uh, my younger brother Tony and my sister Frances were taken to live with my father and his mother and uh, my other uncles. And uh, so 
As soon as we got to St. Boniface, they washed our hair with kerosene and gave us what's called a St. Boniface bob uh, for lice. The kerosene is for lice. So we got the St. Boniface bob. If you see any group pictures, like she showed a lot of pictures of students, you will notice at St. Boniface, everybody has the St. Boniface bob. So uh, yeah, long hair, no matter, you just... So um, yeah, and then life, life was... Um, very rigid, very disciplined. Uh, you got up in the morning, you had breakfast, you went to class, you came home, you, you had lunch, you did work after. Uh, everybody worked cleaning at, at the very least. I was with the little girls. I didn't get to be with my sister who was 10. And my brother obviously was with in the boys' dorm. And um, the nuns were upstairs and the priests were on the other side of the chapel. And uh, I don't recall any playground. I don't recall any toys, uh, but uh, I did, we, we were, I was coming from a home that had dirt floors, no running water, no underplumbing, no electricity. And so it seemed very, very glamorous to me because there was hot water anytime you wanted it. There was a flip of light and there was electricity there, you know, there was, um, floors. It was warm all the time. You know, you didn't have to worry about chopping wood or, or, you know, scavenging for uh, whatever we needed. And so in that sense, you know, it, it was, it was a comfortable place to be physically, but I was six years old. I missed my mother terribly. I missed my family. I missed the reservation. Sometimes our uncles would come and visit us and we would just all go crazy. We'd cling on to them. They'd have to peel us off. And, you know, we, we just, we just, it was heartbreaking, heartbreaking to, to have them leave. I didn't realize that was you, Amalia, until I just saw, <laughs> I thought it was um, Lila's youngest. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it, it was, it was a daily struggle and we had, we had to work. I mean, I can recall them killing pigs and there was we'd all go up there and I don't know what good a six-year-old could do in, in killing a pig but we'd have to watch them butcher that pig and the guys would have to you know or at times bears would come down because it's up toward the foothills bears mm -hmm. would come down and and they'd kill them and and uh and different animals you know that there, there was a big laundry and we'd all have to work in the laundry there were olive trees. We'd have to pick olives. I mean, we'd have a set amount of buckets that we had to fill up. Uh, they'd uh, uh, treat the olives and can them. And uh, it was, it was uh, I don't recall ever a tender moment, uh, a comforting moment, um, nothing else. It was very disciplinary. In the classrooms, there the, the nun, Sister John Bosco, God rest her soul, walk around with a yardstick. And you could hear her coming behind you because she hit it on the floor. And I remember one time, we were, classes were combined, and it happened that my brother John sat in front of me. And he was, I don't know, I can't remember what led up to it, but he was must have been acting up, I don't know. But she got him and she taped his head back to the desk so that he was looking directly in my eyes mm -hmm. and I could see tears coming down his eyes and I'm like what am I going to do mm -hmm. and I could hear her coming with the yardstick you know so I jumped up and I hit her and uh, <laughs> she got me with that yardstick <laughs> she really did she got me I mean but uh, yeah that was that was that was how it was I mean no mercy it, and it's you know like the religion was like, all of you have learned your ABCs. All of you have learned your numbers, one, two, three. Religion is like that. You can't unlearn it. You can't unlearn your ABCs. You can't unlearn your numbers. And you can't, even if you want to, you can't get Catholicism out of your head. I mean, it, it's, it's there. You can learn, they say you can learn over things. I don't know. I haven't found that to be the case, but, uh, it, it was it was very, very, very lonely, very difficult. I had a, a good, good friend. Her name was Helen Jose from Torres Martinez. I slept here and she slept across the way. 
and she was she was she was a huge comfort to me. And another girl, she was an Apache girl, and she had lost both of her legs. Her name was Clydina. I often think about her and wonder whatever happened to her. But she was she was another one of my good friends. I don't know whatever became of her. And um, other than that, I don't remember many other people. Uh, I remember, as I told Francisco, I remember them waking us up one morning. It had to be 1951, 52, I don't remember. But they made us go in the chapel and pray for Dwight Eisenhower to become the president. Yeah. And we wow. know Dwight Eisenhower. <laughs> we, did, we had no idea in the world. I can remember but eating lobster for the first time in my life. I were desert Indians. I had no idea what a lobster was, but we ate it out of the priest's trash can. And uh, yeah, I can remember. And there is a big drainage ditch you can see outside. It comes all the way down the length of Banning. And at times they would let us come to the movies. We would jump in that drainage ditch and run all the way down by the record gazette and jump out and walk over to the movies, go to the movie jump back in the drainage ditch and run back up to St. Cloud. That was once in a while, I don't know if they let us do that. Other than that, we didn't have any entertainment. We entertained ourselves, I guess. Um, it was, it was, uh, I don't remember coming home. I remember making my first communion there. And I remember they would have a May, uh, May, uh, uh, celebration fiesta and I think that's the origination of Malky's fiesta it started there but moved out there and and then the parents would come to that but um other than that we wouldn't my mother obviously didn't come but uh, other Indian people did come that that knew us and would talk to us and share a few words but there that was um a very lonely time you know just and you had to learn you had you you were it was unforgivable not to learn it was a very very strict regime uh, i remember it was it, what i remember is the long driveway it was to me it was very grand thinking of where, where i came from it was a long driveway and there were trees on 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 the side palm trees and then there was the athletic field, and then there was the boys dormitory, and then there were the classrooms. And as you went around the curve, there was the two-story building that was the uh, eating hall, and then the nuns lived above, and then there were the kitchens, and then there was the bigger girls, and then the little girls on the bottom. And I do remember that they did have a TV, but they didn't turn it on very often. Um, at that, at that hall, and then as you continue going around, there was the chapel, but way up in the back behind the girls' dorm was the laundry and the butcher shop and where all the animals were. And there was a, a big um, was a reservoir, would you call it a reservoir, a cistern type situation. And sometimes in the summer, they would let us go swim in there. We walked up there not too long ago, were you with us, Francisco? Oh, not too long ago. It was it was uh, really sad. I mean, it's, it's all overgrown. They say there's one fully operational at the Gilman Ranch in good shape, but that one, it's just like a curved bowl and we would go and swim in there for a little relief. It must've been really hot. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then as you went on around, there were the priest quarters mm -hmm. and then the cemetery behind that. And uh, that was that was uh, in all the orchards and all. It was much bigger. Like Lori said, they sold it off. The diocese sold it off to developers, and developers sold it to developers until it is where it is today. And it is um, I finally got a developer that had some sensitivity, and he gave the tribe 15 acres of land where the cemetery is, and we're going through the ground penetrating radar trying to find everybody outside of, if there's any bodies outside of the fence, because it's obviously a makeshift fence. And um, that's, the situation is that 
even if we find there are bodies and there were from, we have lists of people who passed, children who passed and their reservations, but there's no markers on them. The only piece of people that have markers are the priests and the nuns. Mm -hmm. And there's one Norti child and we, that's an Indian. But other than that, there are no markers. So I don't know how we return anyone, repatriate anyone home. Um, I, the best we can do is make a monument, I guess, and, and um, make sure that it's kept up and honored every May and every November like we do on the res. So uh, that's what we're in the process of doing right now. There's a lot of homeless people up there. There's been a lot of vandalism up there. There is um, some remains, some remains. The, the grotto is still there where the Virgin Mary used to be, but it's all spray painted up. Um, there, there are some things that the, some of the walls are still there that the guys worked on, but uh, it's, it's the, the uh, building, the development is coming right up to the 15 acres and um, uh, the way we found the cistern, because we couldn't, we, I, it wasn't where I remembered it to be. I knew it was off to the side, but one of the young girls said, oh, I used to come and party here when I was in high school. I'll show you where it is. <laughs> so that's how we found out where it was. And we had to climb up a ways to get to it. So it was um, after after they they sold the property, then it, before they sold it, it became a, a boys town. I think it was for court order people. And um, so it, and then that closed. And so then they sold the, the entire property. So that's where we're at with that. It was, um, you know, I think for my mother and in that generation, it was a loss of their language. It was a loss of their Indian identity. It was something they couldn't pass down to, to us children. Um, it was, um, feeling of, of loss, a feeling of, um, you know, um, the, the feeling of being made worthless, but telling you you're worthless, mm -hmm. your way is not the right way, your way is the wrong way, you're bad, you're bad Indian, you need to do this to be right, you know, that kind of thing that was uh, so prevalent uh, among everybody and those that couldn't keep up were were beaten, you know, but I, I personally don't remember, recall any, um, like I hear in a lot of the Canadian stories mm -hmm. that there's uh, rapes, that there's murders, like there's abuse, outright abuse. I, I don't, uh, maybe I was six years old, I didn't see it. I, I wasn't, uh, don't didn't hear anybody talk about it. One of my cousins from Saboba told me that her grandma told them that they were molested in the confessional box. But I, I don't know. That was before my time when I was there. Uh, it was it was a very, very difficult time. I know that uh, my mother, they must have been allowed to go home during the summer because she said they would cry in September when they saw the, the fog come in because they knew that it was getting time for them to go back. And um, but we didn't come home. There was there was no place for us to come home to. We just stayed there for three years, and uh, and then after that, after my mom did come home, then we went started a day school. We were taken to day school in a cattle truck. Now uh, there were no buses in those days, and we had to say the rosary, going home. We had to say the rosary coming to school. So it was, they pounded it in all right. <laughs> and all I can say is that that's that's how it was to me as a small child. I was six years old, and uh, you know, I, I, I think look at my children, my great grandchildren, and I, w I would never ever let that happen to them. I saw an article today that said in November 1893, 19 Hopi Indians were imprisoned in Alcatraz because they refused to send their children to Indian boarding school. So it was it was that that strong of a mandate from the federal government that Indian kids be taken and, and the assimilation that Laurie talked about and kill the Indian, save the man and all of that. So yeah, that's, that's how it went for me. 
Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Oh, Any questions? Basically, the Indian was slaves just like the African American. And they were they were made definitely made to work. That's true. Could you repeat your question? Oh, the question was basically the Indians were slaves just like the African American, and the answer was yes. They were made to work to maintain the grounds. The hundred and fifteen was an acre you said that were there. Kathy, I often went to the Pachanga celebrations in Megalum with them, and they always began the oral history with. If you are a Native American, Pachanga, a lot today, your ancestors were slaves at the missions. No That's way true. To avoid it. That's true. I see it been to the Paula mission, and they have little tiny handcuffs, mm -hmm. little tiny handcuffs. And the, the Indians didn't sleep in houses. They slept in the corrals mm -hmm. with the animals. And they kept the, the kids handcuffed because what parents are going to leave their kids behind? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. There's uh, the haircuts you're talking about. No, those are curled. This, this oh, is just okay. absolutely straight. Um, You'll know a same as Bob when you see one. <laughs> it's kind of like hers, but no bangs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bangs. Just like that. <laughs> That's the same bottom as Bob. Were there any other questions? <laughs> Let me see if there's some online here. Do you still practice Catholicism? No. <laughs> if you have questions but online, put them in the chat, yeah. please. Yeah, I can take a girl out of the Catholic Church. I can't take the Catholic Church out of the girl, I guess. Huh? Mm -hmm. and, uh, a lot of the I'm a Native American from Mexico, and my experience is in forty percent. And when you look in terms of the history of what happened by the church and the Native Americans. All over the continent. Um, it, it's uh, you, you just cannot believe what your ancestors uh, had to do to survive. Mm -hmm. That's right. And 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 it's kind of like the legacy of, of of wanting to do more and try to survive mm -hmm. uh, because of what your history tells you. Mm -hmm. And and so I kept telling because they gave me the DNA since I contested and I get it. I don't care what it says. I don't care what about that. I'm Native American of the Americas, and that's who I am. Mm -hmm. But the history of everything that went on in terms of religion and, and mm -hmm. the, the all, you go to watch the, the the all the what they built and they, it was the native people that mm -hmm. sacrificed a lot mm -hmm. in, in the regions that we know of. Uh, and we placed that you know the idea was not to oh my God. the idea was not to come and live with people that lived in you know and but it was to to kill and possess and and yeah. and and the killing of people became so strong. Mm -hmm. Not the ability, there's no thanksgiving. It was just no redemption, mm -hmm. killing people. That's it. Well, there was no border. So we were Indian, you know, indigenous people. Yeah. And the whole, um, the whole of North America, when Columbus landed, he didn't land here. He landed in yeah. what is now Mexico. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. And started killing the indigenous people right away, yeah. throwing yeah. babies to the dogs. Yeah. There's a lot of murder and persecution in the name of this religion. Yes. And even unintentionally they killed us because we didn't have any resistance to a lot of the right. diseases, diseases they brought. Such, yeah. Yes. They can pop. And my, my, my aunt Catherine Sobel always said they didn't have to even bring a gun. They just gave us a frying pan and sugar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> any questions, Larry Ann? Yeah, any questions online? Let's see. You think you can unmute yourself if you want to add a question? Oh, well, I was just there saying, you, you know, um, God, no, I'm not, I'm in the sun, but um, yeah, I, I I I wanted to say that you know, a lot of times we didn't resist because that wasn't our way. Yeah. 
it wasn't our way to, to turn away people. We, we have our family values and community and taking care of one each other, of each other was probably our biggest downfall. Right. Because we don't know what, we don't know any other way. And I think that's real hard for people to understand that we got taken advantage of because that's, that's not our way. That's right. That's so right. I think a lot, of, a lot of our healing needs to come from we're still those people. We're still those people who care. We, we give everything. We give our family. Our family is the most important thing. And, and a, lot of, a lot of the people, they still don't understand that. And we'll, even what we're going through right now in this pandemic, it's had to stop everybody and like take time with your family now. You have to slow down. And that's, that's taught true. us a lot for just right now. So what, what happened with the boarding schools and all that is, is tragic. And it's not our fault. Yep. And it wasn't our parents' fault and they didn't know they were forced. So we can we can learn from this. And I kind of want to go get a, a bob haircut and just wear it proud. For the, for, the, for, the kids, for, the, for the kids who didn't have a choice it hurts my heart it hurts my heart to see those people my mom my dad's great grandmother was taken when she was five to carlisle she's in the log books and it says mission indian but she did good she did good for herself she made something of herself and she moved on to connecticut she did well. Her her home is still there. I got to visit it. But for the but for the ones who were lost, the ones who were beaten, the ones who never spoke again, who never saw their families again, that's not their fault. And I hurt for them. My mom watched that. I did a, a biography on her when I was in college. And I didn't know a lot of things that she went through until I wrote that biography. And when I took it to the school and I read it and they read it, the, I don't know if it was the, the dean or who, but they came to me directly and said, we need you to have your mom sign this paper. We don't have the story on record and nobody's heard it before. So can you please have your mom come in? We need her ID, we need her to sign this. And we need to get this on record. We don't have this story. So yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah. And thank you. And I'm so proud of you guys for for, for coming up. You know, even even though everybody's experience aren't are the same. And for you and Mary, it was well, you didn't have to think about being cold or having to struggle as much, you know. You did have a couple of your siblings there, but you know. You still missed your mom, and it wasn't by choice, and your mom was sick. It's a different story. It's a different perspective. But yeah. at the same time, a lot of these kids didn't choose this. And we do need to, we need to take that into consideration. Say It's not your fault, and it's, we're going to get better. So that's all I wanted to say. And thank you, ladies, so much. I do want to say that that I believe that it, it shaped me into part of the person I am because I, I learned quickly that there was nobody there who was going to protect me, nobody there who was going to speak up for me, nobody there who was going to help me, and I had to do all those things for myself. And you all know me. I talk, I can talk, and I can stand up for myself, and I often do. And uh, and so that's that's where I, where I learned that I. You know, I, I will protect the, my own. I will speak up for myself and I will stand up and you will hear me. So I think those are all things that, that I learned there. So I guess it, maybe it wasn't all bad, but the way I was taught was bad. Yeah. Come. Oh, let me take the mic over there. So, so folks online can hear you. <laughs> uh, my question is, um, when you guys were taken and they, they just came to the, the reservation and just pulled you guys and took you over there. In my mother's time. In that's my mother's time. Yeah, that's what I, what yeah. I mean. 
I just, my heart just breaks because it just, I, 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 I'm a historian myself. I love to, to go because my grandmother's mother's mother was Indian. And so me and my sister are trying to find out what type of Indian she, and where she came from, we're not really sure. But we're, you know, looking that up. And, and it's just the things that I have heard about what they did is like, you know, so the kids, that, that's where my heart, because I'm for kids. And I just, you know, how cool can these people be just to do the kids like that? I mean, um, it's, it's just, it's a trip. Uh, where, where, were the, where did they get these priests and nuns from? Where did they come from? Hey, I can tell you about that. Okay, and one more question. And the kids, all the kids, was it Morocco? They pulled them from other all states. All Southern California, oh, Arizona. Okay. They were Mexican children. Okay. Some from Beaumont, some that I know today. Okay. okay. Some that have passed. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Here you go. Some are orphans. Okay. I see. Uh, thanks. Okay, so uh, we'll explain kind of where the priests came from and the nuns. Um, there were some comments online. Bridget L. said, really thank you for sharing your story and spending time with us. Much appreciated. A lot of people are saying thank you for sharing. Thank you for uh, trusting us with your story, says Larry Ann. So thank you for that. Um, and yes, thank you very much for sharing your story. I know it's very personal and especially with the um, heightened attention around it, it's, it's tough to talk about. So. My um, sisters won't come because they're so Catholic. They don't want to hear that. Uh, <laughs> so, so uh, my, my sister okay. is Catholic too, and um, I read too much. We've had uh, we've had Native American researchers who are still in the church that have come to research their uh, relatives. So that's that's happened. That's happened here too. Um, so I did this presentation last week. This is on YouTube. You can find it. It's a overview of the history of Saint Boniface and kind of how. Um, the school came to exist. Long story short, in the uh, middle 1880s, the Catholic Church decided that because of the region where the Monterey uh, Los Angeles Archdiocese was, this was a prime location for a school because it was so close to so many different tribes. So Bishop Mora here in 1888 decided that the San Antonio Pass was the, the perfect region to have uh, the St. Boniface School. So in um, 1888, he sent a couple of uh, Benedictine monks uh, to come to, or priests, I should say, uh, came to the Banning train station right here, went to go visit Dr. Wellwood Murley, and Dr. Murray owned uh, a huge tract of farm uh, here in Banning, and that's where they uh, bought the school. So they bought the land from Dr. Murray. He went and actually sold the property to them, and then went, uh, went into Palm Springs to create some uh, a sanitarium. They're using the hot springs. So um, Palm Springs actually is part of its creation story. It's from the St. Boniface story as well here. Um, when the school was created, the thing that kind of always plagued it was that it was always struggling for fun. So uh, when the Benedictine sect was there, they had um, problems raising the money for the tools, the equipment, the orchards, things like that. So what they did was they asked uh, benefactor mother Catherine Drexel, who was uh, a wealthy, wealthy heiress. She was so wealthy, um, her, I think, total inheritance now is like over $190 million. And, what she, and that was a lot of money back then in 1890. So what she did was she paid for some of the uh, extra equipment that was needed on the farm that Dr. Murray didn't have. And she also bought the cattle and, uh, cattle and pigs, other things like that. And that continued, she continued to be a benefactor until 1936. Okay, we're someone's taking a photo. So this is a solid hour lecture. So I'm kind of just going through it very quickly. So the priests were what kind of priests? Uh, they were Benedictine. It changes over time. So there was uh, oh. Benedictine, then there was Franciscans in the uh, 40s, and then later it got uh, changed to a diverse sect. So, anyways, nuns or so this is Father Han. Father Han is the primary uh, person that was the longtime administrator of the school in the 1930s. He wasn't the first, but he was the longest acting. He was given the um, he was given the, the school to administer because he had come from a different Catholic Indian school in Rensselaer, Indiana. And that school was actually the model for St. Boniface, St. Boniface, even down to the way the buildings were laid out. And he had been there for quite some time. And he actually died uh, in Oxnard, but was buried at St. Boniface as well. And he is known in the Catholic archives and in their his, historical uh, records as being 
very much like Kunipero Sir. So he goes and creates, and he's credited with starting 13 mission systems, 13 mission um, schools in the Southland, so Southern California region. Um, he also was trained before he was a priest into the printing, uh, printing and news uh, industry. So this photo comes from the Sisters of St. Joseph of the Carondelet in St. Louis. It's rarely seen, and it's him with uh, some Native American students creating the, um, the Mission Indian Press uh, pamphlet they would have quarterly. So this is rarely seen. I got that from their archive in St. Louis. Anyways, time goes on. And during the 40s, after World War II, there had been, um, when he died actually here in 1916, he was buried at the uh, cemetery. He's still there today. Then you have the Franciscan era, 1921 to 1952. The problem with the Benedictines at that time was that they had now become quite aged. And so even amongst the different administrations in the Catholic system, they were seeing some pretty big deficits. They were um, not keeping adequate records. There was an earthquake that happened in Moma School that uh, had been completely unreported to the uh, Chancery Office. It's kind of the head administration office of the diocese. And so the bishop at the time decided to remove them. And it became a big scandal because these people had been here for a long, long time. And it was in the newspaper and the Franciscans um, and the Benedictines took their case to a higher authority in Rome. And the Roman um, folks, they came and actually did an on the ground investigation. And they said, no, it's actually being run quite poorly. So let's remove you and add a different sect in. So in come the Franciscans. But the cash problem still, you know, still subsists. They're still trying to find different sources of income, so on and so forth. And then they change out into the 50s. By 1959, it become a boys' town. It's called Boys' Town, USA. This was no longer run by one sect. These were now different priests in different sects of the diocese. Uh, this is Joseph Sadler. He was the first administrator of Boys' Town. Uh, the school was falling apart. None of the built of the buildings had gone back to the early teens that were really in bad repair. So what they did was they tried to do a whole brand new um, publicity scheme and say, well, we're changing now. We're going to go to a fully kind of secularized, um, you know, administration. We're getting kids in from county programs and having orphans or foster care programs and things like that. It was now a boys' school, so on and so forth. And I'm covering broad ground here. And then at the very end, the campus was no longer um, mostly able to be used in its full capacity. So the church decided we're going to go buy a property over in Beaumont and create a whole different campus because this one is so old and so uh, run down. We no longer have the money to repair it. So they did create a different boys town in, in Beaumont and then the campus was sold uh, in the late 60s and 70s. It was torn down and condemned by the city of Dang. Uh, in 1975. So that's kind of how the school ends. But the problem they had already originally from the 1890s all the way to the very end was consistent funding. And it was never able to keep up with the um, expansion, the different students they got from all over the different systems, county, federal, different tribes, so on and so forth, uh, and also keep the programs running at the same pace that they needed. So uh, check and that they, out. And it's, they it's sent a, all the records to Marquette University. Yeah, there's, there's Marquette a University and then the nuns and theirs yes. too. Um, so if you're looking for records about folks that went to St. Boniface or to Catholic um, Indian schools, Marquette University, like Marianne mentioned, is um, one of the, university. is a Catholic university. And what all the different Indian, uh, Catholic Indian institutions did was they put their photo archives there and some of the other um, different documents as well. Now, in particular for St. Boniface, the faculty was run by the Sisters of St. Joseph. They were known as the teaching, you know, a teaching kind of um, sect. They were uh, given the responsibility of being the faculty and nuns on campus. And so they have their own archive as well. Their archive was in Los Angeles up until about 10 years ago. And then it was moved to the national headquarters in St. Uh, St. Louis, Missouri. So at the end of the program, I'll send you my sources as well, plus also the links to their archives. So if you're doing research, you can find um, some of the things I've mentioned here as well uh, with their own archive in St. Louis. So it's scattered throughout the country. It's not in any one particular location. Okay. That's kind of a rundown of the, the history of the campus. Okay. Is there any more questions? Right. Any more questions here? In the chat or anywhere? See. Okay. Okay, someone said, can you spell that? Well, I'm not sure we're trying to get me to, to spell, but anyways, if you have questions, we can uh, answer later or and have our 
uh, guest presenters answer offline. We will do that. Please put them in the chat, and then I'll send you the links, Lori's uh, presentation, and the link she sent to me about research too. Oh yes, Kat. I am so sorry that I've run out of time and have to go. I can't thank you enough for this sharing today. I'm absolutely overwhelmed. It was so beautiful with you to share. So thank, thank you for coming, Kathy. Kathy. Say hello. Thank, 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 thank you all. Thank you. All right, so okay. I guess uh, that concludes our program. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.